Today we're going to be talking about the pressure gradient force. The pressure gradient force is the primary force that causes the wind to blow. Uh, mathematically, the pressure gradient force, uh, if you divide by mass, uh, since force is equal to mass times acceleration, is actually the acceleration due to the pressure gradient force, and that's really what we're after. So the acceleration due to the pressure gradient force is actually equal to minus 1 over the density times the gradient operator of the pressure. So it's the gradient of pressure. And if you remember from last time, uh, the gradient of a scalar is partial p over partial x in the i-hat direction, plus partial p over y in the j-hat direction, plus partial p over partial z in the k-hat direction. <clears throat> but you also might recall that the hydrostatic assumption uh, is that uh, dp by dc is equal to minus rho g. Uh, so that assumption is that the uh, atmosphere is not moving away from the surface or down towards the surface. It's the hydrostatic, which is the not moving fluid equation. Uh, and uh, you also, if you go ahead and solve for dp over rho, you'll see that that's minus g dz. And if you recall, uh, the uh, g dz is actually the differential of the geopotential. So we can take that and put it back into the equation and we now have a different form for the acceleration due to the pressure gradient force is also equal to the gradient of the geopotential. And the geopotential and the geopotential height, z, are related by this equation. Um, so you also have this is equal to g naught times the uh, gradient of the geopotential height. The geopotential height is typically what we use on uh, constant pressure maps. So for example, a 500 millibar map, you'll have highs and lows on that. What those highs and lows actually are, um, since everything on that map is a constant pressure, is a high in terms of the geopotential height or a low in terms of the geopotential height. So the pressure gradient force, uh, things to note about it, it always points from high to low. Uh, it's always perpendicular to the isobars. It causes the wind to blow, and it's strongest where the isobars are actually close together. So here's an example of a high and low pressure system with isobars in between. And we have here the pressure gradient force is always essentially at a right angle or perpendicular to the isobars. And the strength of the pressure gradient force is proportional to the gradient or how tightly packed the uh, isobars are. So the strongest winds here would be at this location right here where the isobars are closest together and the pressure gradient is largest. And as you move to these other areas, say out here, where the pressure gradient is weak, the winds would be relatively uh, light. So I want to take an app a quick application of the pressure gradient force uh, to show how it can impart motion. <clears throat> so over here, we have a situation where we have water adjacent to land, it's during the day, and we have these two columns of air at the boundary layer at about 800 millibars and the surface pressure being 1,000 millibars. These are exactly the same conditions, exactly the same temperature, but the sun is going to beat down and it's going to warm up the land faster than it is the water. Why is it going to warm up the land faster? Because the land has a uh, lower heat capacity than the water. And also, the sunlight is being absorbed in the very top layer of the uh, land while that sunlight is penetrating into the water. So the heating is being distributed over a deeper layer of the water. The net result is that the column of air uh, over the land is going to warm up faster than the column of air over the water. And as you warm this air column, it's going to expand. And so as it expands, it's going to move up that direction. And you have not changed the surface pressure uh, because you have not added or removed mass from this column of air. All you have done is physically expanded the column and moved the pressure surfaces upward. So in this example, uh, what used to be the 800 pressure surface is now greater than 800. So let's just say that it might be like 810 millibars. What we've done is we've created a high pressure 
in this location and a low pressure at that location and the air will start to move from high to low pressure. But as you remove mass from this column of air and push it and add it to this column over here, it's going to reduce the pressure at the surface. So let's just reduce that to 990. And we're going to add that mass to this column over here, which is going to increase the surface pressure and to 1010. Now I'm obviously exaggerating these numbers, but you get the idea. And now what we've done is we've created a high pressure here and a low pressure at the surface due to changes that were happening up here at the top of the boundary layer. And now you'll have flow from high to low uh, at the low level. And to complete the, uh, the cycle or the circulation, we call this a thermally direct circulation. Um, it's being driven by differential heating. And if you happen to be near the ocean, we would refer to this as a sea breeze. Uh, here in Utah, uh, where we have the Great Salt Lake, we refer to this as a lake breeze. And it results from a differential heating of the land and the water. And you'll get this type of thermally direct circulation at any time you have differential heating. And as long as the motion takes much, much less than one day to set up. Because in this time frame of a time scale of these motions being less than one day, the rotation of the Earth is insignificant, and you'll have this thermally direct circulation. At nighttime, you'll have a very different uh, opposite uh, impact. So at nighttime, the land is going to cool faster than the water, which is going to cool this air mass or this column of air, which is going to cause the column to con contract or to be compressed. And now, at this level, you have a lower pressure than you had before. So now you have high pressure on this side, low pressure on this side, with a flow from, the, uh, from this column to that column. Taking mass out of this column, adding it to this column, is going to reduce the surface pressure over here to, say, 990. And it's going to increase the surface pressure over here to 1010, which is a high and a low. And to complete the circulation, we now have a thermally direct circulation, but it's now in the opposite direction at night due to the differential uh, heating, or in this case, cooling, of the land surface and the water. Uh, we would refer to this as a land breeze uh, because the air is coming from the land towards the water. And both of these are essentially examples of a thermally direct circulation driven by pressure gradient force. So when somebody asks me why does the wind blow, I would say because we have an unequal heating distribution on our planet. And we can have an unequal heating distribution on different scales. So for example, you can have a mountain, and you can have differing irradiance on the north facing slope versus the south facing slope can give you differential heating and can impart motion. Or you can think globally, there's a large distribution of differential heating between the equator and the pole due to the curvature of the Earth and how the irradiance uh, is a function of latitude. Uh, so in that case, you have much stronger heating at the equator, much weaker heating towards the pole, creates a temperature difference, which imparts motion to the atmosphere through pressure gradients. So when somebody asks me, why does the wind blow? I could simply answer, because the Earth is round. But they're going to miss all of the steps in between about the differential heating. Uh, so a temperature differences really drive the motions in the atmosphere.